Hi, I'm Madeline Maldonado with Vision Earth Channel, and I'm here at the Fairchild Gardens covering the Mango Festival. The mango somehow brought to the United States has been treated with heavy chemicals that are no good for us. I said it before, but I'll say it again. All these mangoes were grown at the Fairchild Farm. So what we're really doing is, at Fairchild Garden, our mission is to cultivate both plants and people. So we use our plant collections as education tools in order to really engage, starting at a very young age, right up through uh, junior high and high school, up to college, and all the way up to um, um, grad school. So we're really creating a green future for the world based on a better understanding of the plant diversity that's around us. And if you can shed light on one particular issue or, um, or something that you're working on, what would, you, would it be? Well, in, in our case, uh, we are working a lot on the mangiferous species, which is the idea that these wild mangoes, they're in danger of extinction. They're, we're losing them every day. These are these are plants that if we lose these fruit, they're gone forever. We're never going to get these genes back. Each one of these genes has the potential to be the new great thing for commercial or the new great thing for backyard growing, the new great thing to engage some young person for a reason to save this, the planet and, and their environment. So we're, we're uh, going around collecting plants around the uh, tropical Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Borneo, in these areas. We bring them back here, we characterize them genetically, mm -hmm. then we, from that we learn how to grow these plants better, we cross them, and then eventually we create both new novel crops and better versions of the crops we already have. You're growing new types of mangoes. If you can share more, give us more information about that. What we're really trying to do is create fruit that are no, that mangoes that are more resistant to diseases, more smaller trees, easier to manage. They make more money for growers, easier for a homeowner to grow, taste better, more nutritious. Um, the whole idea is you don't want to create new products that take a great deal of um, input of chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, we're very cognizant of the fact that anything we can do to make the mango more green will be mm -hmm. great for the consumer. Mm -hmm. It's great for all of, um, for the homeowners. So, you know, here in the South Florida, it's great for us because we grow these mangoes in our yeah. backyard. We don't, um, what we do in our botanical garden is we do not use, we teach our people to use very sustainable, organic uh, growing and we're, it's, we know it's extremely important. Now, what are your views on GMOs and pesticides? That's the big issue. We, we particularly are very clear that what we do is we, we don't work with GMOs. Yeah. What we're doing is classical breeding, which means we do the old fashioned build a cage around them, have the two trees in the cage, they get cross pollinated, and then we grow out seedlings from that. So it's really old school. Yeah. Um, so we don't we don't do anything in terms of GMO and in terms of pesticides that's really what our entire objective is with these uh, wild mangoes is we're trying to create things where you don't need to use pesticides um, the Fairchild farm is grown in a completely organic manner um, we we do everything we can in order to create or take away the need for using of chemicals. We're already very far advanced in this, but we can go further so that you create a really a superior product that doesn't need any of that. I see. So if you can, I guess, um, talk a little bit about people growing mangoes in their own homes, how it can benefit them, how can they go about in doing so? so the great thing is already people can do an immense amount. I mean, here in, in Florida and anywhere in really in the tropics and the subtropics, we have mangoes that people can grow in their yard 
small spaces, um, even in containers that you can grow them. So you can grow them in a condo in the middle of a city. You can grow them in parks, you can grow them on roofs, you can grow them in very, very tight spaces. It's just a wonderful thing you can do. You need really nothing in terms of pesticides. So we don't use any, uh, any herbicides, pesticides of any kind in our growing of mangoes. A homeowner, there's absolutely no reason. The way we look at it is, you know, I have children, they're now a little older, but I always wanted it to open the door, let them out in the backyard, um, eat whatever you want, as long as, you know, it's not poisonous, mm -hmm. and you're not gonna be worrying about toxicities about poisonings and of course it's also better for the you know the nutrition of the fruit and all the way around is much better and if you can tell us about the medicinal properties about the mango if you can yeah. well you see we with mango you know we're all we're all just primates all right and the mango comes from Malaysia uh, Borneo is one of the main areas where it comes from it's really adapted co co-evolution with primates, orangutans mainly. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the great distributors of mangoes. So chemically, mangoes have a, have a great effect on us. So medicinally, I would contend that mangoes drive us to eat them. I mean, the mangoes are really playing the great trick on us. I mean, we are just, uh, they found a way off of Borneo and we're more efficient than orangutans. You know, we can take planes and carry them around, and that's a lot better for them. So, medicinally, mangoes have have a great deal. I mean, it's super high in vitamins, uh, vitamin A, vitamin C. Um, they're they're also high in sugar, which is good. It's good sugar. That's why we eat mangoes. We eat mangoes for sugar. Uh, I won't, don't don't kid anybody. I'm not eating them to for a diet food, um, but that. It, it, they have a, if you go into other cultures, particularly Asia, tropical America, um, they'll use them for sore throat treatments, they'll use mangoes for exfoliating treatments. The latex of mangoes, because mango is in the poison ivy family, and it is a very good exfoliation or exfoliating agent. Um, it's used a lot in, in homeopathic uh, treatments in Brazil, for instance, uh, where I'm familiar with the use of it. Um, it, you know, it's a, a very, very, it has a lot of active ingredients in a mango and it's very much alive. That's another reason that we like mangoes grown in our own environments instead of when mangoes come in are exported in general all over the world. They go through a, a hot water bath. It doesn't involve any chemicals, but what that does is it essentially changes the chemical composition of the skin. Um, it, it, and it takes away, I think, a little bit of the, it certainly takes away a little of the nutritive value of the mango, but also some of the medicinal values of the mango. The, the water bath that they use for the mangoes is 115 degrees Fahrenheit um, for about an hour that they treat them. Um, it doesn't, it, uh, it changes the flavor of a mango. It does change the components of the skin. Um, it's not all bad. It, it also is a good way to non-chemically uh, control the pests of the mango. So it's not a bad thing, but it does change it. Mango is, is arguably the most consumed fruit in the world. Um, it's a very important staple product across all the tropics, Asian tropics, African tropics, American tropics. You find mango used in every form. I mean, if you go into India, for instance, I mean, they eat mango in any way you can think of. I mean, you take the small fruit, the big fruit, the medium fruit, the large fruit, the drops, everything, dry them, grind them, so it's an ex vitally important fruit to both the nutritional input into a family, particularly subsistence people. So that's what makes the mango such an incredible fruit is it goes all the way from subsistence level to middle class up to the most wealthy of people. So when you go into any country, there's always kings that have great collections of mangoes. So it's a, 
it's consumed on all levels and that's what makes it just so much volume of mangoes, uh, of so much volume of fruit that's consumed. Um, it, most of that fruit never finds its way onto paper. I mean, it's not calculated because we're talking about small villages where it's carried to market. There's nobody writing it down, people growing them in their backyard. I mean, anywhere in the tropics, that's the mango. So Fairchild Garden, Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden here in Coral Gables, Florida, we have, we're a wonderful green space in the middle of urban Miami. And it is truly, uh, it's a beautiful place, um, but the heart of what we do is always education. Um, we are really, truly here to give people a respite from that bustling day-to-day, -day, the busy, the noise, the take. So uh, at least all of us here feel it's very important that um, we as humans, we have to have a place like Fairchild Garden to go to. Botanical gardens give you that recharging possibility in a city. So you can come here and walk around and, and the, all of this diversity around you is what gives you that, um, it's very important to you whether we know it or not. So my routine morning is get up, pick the fruit. I walk with my geese. I have geese at the farm and chickens. Those are my companions with a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. I get the mango from the tree and then I start doing these small mangoes. I think they have to be treated differently. Mm -hmm. So it's different, so many ways to eat a mango. And why would you treat them differently in that say? Because I, I, I feel that it's uh, more comfortable to eat it this way. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that it has a big stone when mangoes are like this size. So you don't have any way just actually to get the two chicks out and peel it. So, and the skin of this one is thick compared with the other mangoes that I will eat it just mm. directly to my mouth. So I make like a little rose because again, this one has a completely different structure of the, it's very thick. You can feel mm -hmm. that I have to pressure can you sense the smells yes. of, of the fruit already? And then I just... These mangoes are absolutely delicious. It tastes like lychees combined with passion fruit. And when you eat wild mangoes, normally you have this aftertaste. It's a sensation that goes through your mouth to your throat and then goes back to your nose. It's like eating kasabi, the Japanese mm -hmm. green thing. It's exactly the same sensation. And when you eat so many of these mangoes, actually you, you, your breath change. You, in the end, you start smelling like them and give us, in other words. So it's, it's something directly with that. It's like, for example, when you are eating too much garlic, then mm -hmm. you start smelling garlic also, mm -hmm. it's like the durians, for example. But in my opinion, fruit had to be eaten with all your senses. Everything starts with the aroma. Mm -hmm. Fruit that doesn't have much aroma, doesn't wake up our appetite. Color is important, that's obvious. So we have all this diversity of color when you go to the grocery store and red catches your eye. Now it's quite different because we have other codes about color. And this one, for example, has purple color that immediately connected with health. It's antioxidant. So this is a powerful thing for me, the color of the skin of the Mangifera casturi. I don't think that we have to change anything of this fruit. I believe that we can develop up actually a market. I will dream if we can help people in Borneo, for example, that we are collecting this fruit, they have a lot of tourists that they can develop a different market. They are helping and funding the ecosystem. If they buy the fruit, people will protect the tree and they won't get extincted. So I'm doing my research right now in economics and I'm traveling uh, every November and I'm taking all this data 
about how much they get for the income of the house with these wild mangoes. So they can understand better. You know, sometimes, sometimes now, I will say always now, when you put things with numbers, people pay attention to it. Okay, this represents 30% of the income of my family. Now we are talking about something different. When people is growing something and you put numbers on it and say, you know, I'm gardening, I can produce 10 pounds of tomatoes every year. I have letters and I have all these other different things that you can grow in your house and you put numbers on it, you pay attention to it. That's directly proportional to your economics. And so you pay attention to it. So I'm trying to help in my project, in my team, to develop a strategic plan in economics with these wild species in Borneo, just to help them out to protect these species in their own area. Uh, also, I'm recording all these different recipes. I, I am a, a, a forestry engineer, that's my first background. And I used to work in the forest for about 15 years in the Amazons and working with communities. And I learned from many years ago that when you are talking about rebuilding the forest, ecology, it's not that simple. You have to combine it in a language that people can understand. It's very easy, it's very comfortable for us that we are living in the United States where the abundance is everywhere and you can just open the top and you have water running, then you can just go to the store and get anything you want, more than you need. But when you are talking about those areas and they have to be very creative, uh, they eat the leaves because they don't have vegetables, a way to grow vegetables really. They eat ferns from the forest, they eat frogs, and they eat fruit in different ways. So I want to record the uses of the mangifera species in those native areas. I think it's a lot of knowledge, also for medicine purposes. So they use, they make their own medicine for the coughing, uh, medicine for the stomach problems uh, as an antioxidant. So they have their own recipes. So I'm going there on this November to record all this information and put it in my project. Uh, as a companion of what we are doing in terms of breeding program and, and the whole, it's, it's like a chain, it's a, a progress in the program. It's, it's like when we start the project, it was just only conservation. The first time that I visit Borneo as a forestry working in the Amazonians areas, for me was so peaceful. I just close my eyes and I feel the sound of the forest and it was just the same like in Colombia, in my country. And I had that need to help and try to do something different. So we start doing all this, collecting, bringing those back. It was a challenge because it's not easy to do these kind of projects. You have so many barriers to do it. So you have the protocols that you have to follow. We don't know if, if they match or not in order to make a new tree here in different routes. It's very complicated. But then we are advancing in the process and it's like you are seeing other ways to help of avoid the extinction of these species. And one is the use of the fruit. This fruit has a lot of potential. We actually here at the garden two years ago make a distribution of the trees. There are 200 of mangifera casturi growing in some of these backyards around here and this is conservation for us. If we can go beyond that, and we can make this fruit more appealing to everybody, then they can see another value. In the beginning, nobody knew about chutneys, for example. Chutney is something new that came with the Indian community. They didn't have refrigeration. So they have to be creative, how to conserve the fruit. So the only way to do it is use of vinegar, salt, and sugar, then prevent the growth of bacteria and they make it happen. And then they add the spices, the chiles, and now it's so popular. When I talk with any American, even any Latin, they know what I'm talking about. Chutney 
it's part of our lives, it's part of our vocabulary, it's nothing new. So I'm hoping that if I can bring some of those recipes back, so people can see this fruit with different eyes and they are willing to try it. Tell me a little bit about Fairchild Gardens. Fairchild Tropical Garden is a paradise here in Miami. Everybody that come to the garden will have one of the best experience for the tropics. We have um, one of the larger ma uh, palm collections of the garden. Uh, we have a diversity of fruit trees, cactus, orchids, and a beautiful pavilion of butterflies. Uh, it's a unique place to visit. Um, we are working heavily with the new generation, so we have programs with students from all different grades. Um, and that's one of our strongest points of where to go is education. So we want to grow people and grow plants. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you agree with me? Mm -hmm. It's so rich, yeah. yeah. And it's nice and light too, it's not a very heavy. Mm -hmm. very this is amazing. Is this your favorite one? Yes, I love it. Oh, I have been eating so many. 